In the first video in this series, we covered exactly what a developer environment is and why you might want one. In our second video, we covered how to install a basic set of developer tools on a Windows workstation. This video will cover how to install those tools on a Mac OS workstation. And the last video in the series will cover how to install these tools on a CentOS or Linux workstation. As a reminder, here's the basic set of tools that we'll be looking at how to install. And again, this set of tools is not intended to be the only set of tools you may want to use, or even indicate a specific tool that is better than another. This simply provides a set of tools that will get you started as a development in, in your development environment with a set of tools that are available, free and easy to use on any of the basic platforms that are out there. If you have another tool that you're familiar with, by all means, use that as you go forward. With all that said, let's dive into the hands-on component of this. We're gonna look at how we can walk through the installation of each one of these tools on our Mac OS workstation. Let's get to it. All right, here we are, and I've logged into a brand new Mac OS workstation without any of the developer tools already installed. We'll use this to walk through the installation of each one of the tools we've talked about. What I've done so far is logged into the Learning Lab system and access the developer workstation and environment setup module, and we'll scroll down and we'll find the lab on Mac OS. Here it is. We'll click the button to start the lab. Now as the lab starts up, we can walk through here at the basic interface that we've got for the Learning Lab. Our objectives here are to install the basic development tool set and verify that each one is working. Now one thing we want to do want to make sure we note is this requirement for administrative rights. During this lab, we'll be installing software onto our workstation, and this means we need to be logged in with an account that has the ability to install software. If you're working from a managed laptop from a corporation or work, and you do not currently have an administrative account, be sure to contact your IT department to get admin access before continuing this lab. Let's move along to the Mac OS specific preparation. Now in order to install all of these tools, we'll be leveraging Homebrew. If you're not familiar with Homebrew, you may be familiar with YUM or AppKit on other Linux platforms. YUM and AppKit are what are called package management systems and they enable you to easily install different pieces of software using the CLI tool on the Linux platforms. Homebrew offers that same capability for Mac OS. Now in order to install that, we'll run this Ruby script in just a moment, but let's take a look at the Homebrew site before we dive in. Here we can see Homebrew is the missing package manager for Mac OS. This is an open source project that you can take a look at and dive into, and it's highly popular for getting access to developer tools, as well as any types of common applications on your Mac platform. Going back to the Learning Lab, we want to go through and walk through these steps. We can see that I've got a terminal window already open. Now, the first step we want to do is make sure that our Xcode developer tools are installed and functioning properly. Xcode is, the, is a set of developer tools from Apple themselves, and Homebrew under the hood is going to use a couple of those during the installation process. If you haven't done this already, let's go ahead and do this command. So I'll copy this Xcode select install over to my terminal window and run it. We can see that it comes up and says it's going to install the command line developer tools on our workstation. We'll say install. All right, that installation is completed. We'll go ahead and click done to finish it. Now the next step is we'll run this Ruby command to go ahead and download and install Homebrew onto our Mac OS workstation. Copy this straight out of the learning lab and into our terminal window. Homebrew is finished installing. We can verify that it was installed successfully by typing brew-v, and we can see we're on Homebrew 163, slightly newer than the Learning Lab, but no problem. Now the last piece we want to do with Homebrew is install an add-on called Cask. Homebrew gives you a quick and easy ability to install standard applications and packages, but when we're talking about large applications, Cask is an enhancement that lets us install. For example, to install Google Chrome, Postman, or other large applications, we'll use Cask. To go ahead and get ourselves ready for that, we will go ahead and type brew, oops, brew, tap, cask, room, slash cask, or copy and paste from the Learning Lab. All right, Cask is also installed. We'll move on to source control systems. 
Now our source control system that we'll be using is Git, a common and probably the most common source control system today. When we did the installation of the Xcode command line tools in the previous step to get ready before installing Homebrew, Git was actually installed as part of those tools. Let's verify that it's working as expected. We'll type git space dash dash version, and we can see that we do indeed have Git. Let's test that it's working actually fully by cloning down a hello network repository from GitHub. We'll copy this command, this git clone command, into our terminal window. And we can see that it came down, it cloned successfully and put us into the appropriate, or it went ahead and cloned down our repository for us. Our next step will be terminals and shells. Now our preferred terminal for working in our development environment will be bash. And thankfully, the default terminal for Mac OS, as it's based on Linux, is indeed bash. Let's verify that everything is working as expected with our bash shell. We'll change into the hello network directory, which is what we just cloned down after testing our git tools, and we will take a look in this directory. So we can see that we have a hello network.sh command. This is a bash script. Let's see if it's working and is runnable. We need to give it the sh version not so that we know, and we can see indeed we do have hello network ran successfully, and we can see that our bash shell is working as expected. Moving along into programming languages. Now from our programming languages, we'll be installing both Python and Node. Python is a common programming language used for many infrastructure and networking developers, and Node is a great application for building web applications and backends and application middleware. These are two great programming languages to install in your development environment as you're getting started. We'll be using Homebrew to do these installations. We'll start with Python 2714. I'll copy this command from our learning lab and we will paste this into our terminal window. This will kick off the installation of Python version 2 using Homebrew. All right, our installation of Python 2 is completed. Scrolling down, we'll see what our next step is. Here, we'll install the latest version of Python 3.6. We'll do that once again with Homebrew. In this case, we're just doing brew install Python. If we remember in our previous command for Python 2, we had Python at 2 to specify the version. Python 3 is the default version of Python installed with Homebrew, so we don't need to specify the version. All right, our Python 3 installation is completed. Let's verify that both 2.7 and 3 are now at the latest versions. We'll start out by checking Python 3.6. And we can see we are indeed at Python 3.6.5. Now let's verify the version of Python 2.7. We can see Python 2.7.14 came back. This is slightly newer than the 2.7.14 from our learning lab, but it, because of the, a new release of Python 2.7 having come out. Now that we have Python installed successfully, let's go ahead and do our final Python steps. We're gonna set up and verify that Python virtual environments are functioning as we would, will need. If you're not familiar with Python virtual environments, these are a way of creating isolated environments where specific versions of Python can be installed along with their libraries and dependencies. We'll be using virtual environments in nearly every Python learning lab that leverages Python across the system, so let's make sure that everything is working as expected. We'll create the first Python virtual environment using Python 3. So Python 3.6 to specify the version of Python we're interested in, dash M VENV to leverage the VENV module that's included with Python 3.6, and then we're gonna create a Python virtual environment called PY3-VENV. The creation is completed. Let's go ahead and activate that with, with the source command. Source py3venv slash bin slash activate will activate our virtual environment. And we know that it's activated because of this indication in front of our prompt of py3venv. If we do a Python space dash v, we can see that we are now inside of our virtual environment using Python 3.6.5 as our Python interpreter. We can deactivate this virtual environment with the deactivate command. Now we'll repeat the steps for Python 2. 
However, for Python 2, we need to install the virtual environment library using pip. So Python 2.7 to grab our Python 2.7 installation, dash m pip, in this case the pip module, which will allow us to install virtual env. Now that virtual env has been installed, we can use Python 2.7-m and virtual env that we just installed with pip, and the virtual environment we'll create this time will be py2venv. We can now activate the Python 2 virtual environment once again with the source command. And if we check our version of Python now, we are at Python 2.7.15 inside of our virtual environment. We can deactivate this virtual environment and move ahead to our Node installation. Now, just like with Python, we will use Homebrew to install Node. We can use the basic brew install node command to install it. And if we scroll down now that the installation is completed, we can see how we can verify that it installed successfully with the node-v command. We are on node 10. Looks like a newer version of node has come out since the learning lab was written, but that is not a problem. Moving along to our text editors and IDE step. In this case, we'll be installing Atom as our text editor and IDE. To do so, we'll be using Cask, the add-on for Homebrew that we installed at the preparation steps. Once again, Cask lets us install full-featured programs and applications, in addition to the small um, utilities and applications that is done by Brew on its own. So Brew, Cask, install, Atom. Right, Adam is successfully installed. Let's go ahead and verify that it opens and we can use it. We'll do that just by typing Adam in our terminal window. We can see Adam indeed is opening up. All right, Adam is successfully installed. We won't be using it right now, so we'll go ahead and we'll quit out of it. We can now move on to the step for development tools and clients. Now the first tool that we'll be installing is Postman. Once again, we'll be using Brew Cask to install Postman. All right, Postman shows successfully installed. Let's see if it shows up in our application launcher. Indeed it does, along with Atom. All right, once Postman opens, it will prompt you to either sign up, sign up or sign in to Postman. You do not need to do that. You can simply skip the sign in step and take you straight to the app with this link at the bottom. We'll close these pop-ups and now go back into our learning lab and see how we can verify that Postman is working. We can do so by making a quick REST API call to grab a joke from the dad joke API. We'll copy this link here for the actual URL that we'll query to and paste this in the URL field. And we do need to set the header type to accept application JSON. With that in place, we'll send our API call and enjoy our joke. What did the judge say to the dentist? Do you swear to pull the tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth? That's a really good one. All right, we can see that Postman is actually working successfully. Let's go ahead and quit out of it and continue along.
Now we'll install ngrok. ngrok is a tool that developers can use to build temporary connections from their laptop off to the public internet to support inbound access for applications. For example, if you're building a chatbot and you need access for the software running on your development workstation for inbound requests from the cloud, you can use ngrok to build up that local development tunnel. We'll use Cask to install ngrok like in the previous steps. The installation is completed. We'll scroll down and we can test that ngrok was successfully installed by typing ngrok HTTP 5000. This is building a temporary connection from our workstation off to the public internet, supporting an application that we could run on our laptop on port 5000. We can see our session status shows as online and the tunnel is working. We don't actually have an application running on our laptop, so we can't test further, but this shows that the application is working as expected. Control C to quit. Our next application that we'll install is Google Chrome. Now, even if you use a different browser as your preferred tool, remember Google Chrome offers a really excellent set of developer tools, as well as if you're working with web applications, testing in multiple browsers can be handy. We can install Google Chrome using Brewcask as well. Okay, the installation is completed successfully. Let's go ahead and open up Google Chrome and make sure that it works. In this case, I will not change my default browser, but feel free to pick whichever browser works for you. Now the reason we installed Google Chrome was the access the developer tools. You can find them under the three dots more tools and developer tools. This will open this side panel. It gives you access to all of the developer tools. You are in good shape for Chrome. I'm going to close Chrome now and go back to using Safari to view the learning lab. Moving down to OpenConnect, our VPN client. Now, if you have Cisco AnyConnect already installed for corporate reasons, or some other purpose, feel free to continue to use it. However, if you do not have any Connect installed, you can use the open source alternative of OpenConnect. We'll use Brewcask to install this. To fully test OpenConnect as a VPN client is functioning, you need a VPN to connect to. If you don't have one handy, feel free to run over to the DevNet Sandbox catalog and check out one of our possible sandboxes. The reservation completion email will include the VPN credentials. We won't do that now in this video, but we will show that the, how to open up and access the client. We can find the OpenConnect GUI underneath the application launcher. We can see that we do need to provide our admin credentials in order to use it as the VPN will be creating a tunnel and updating the network connectivity. Here in the OpenConnect configuration, we would add a new profile and provide the address to our VPN endpoint. This is what would be provided inside of the email from the DevNet reservation system. After saving and connecting, you would provide your username and password to set up your VPN connection. We'll go ahead and close out of OpenConnect for now. This finishes the development tools and clients and we'll move on to the application container engine. And for us, that will be Docker. Now, in order to install Docker, we won't be using Homebrew. We'll actually be moving over to the docker.com site to download Docker directly. So we'll click on this link. And then we'll get Docker CE from Docker Store. I need to make my window just slightly bigger, and we will see here on the side where we can get Docker Community Edition for Mac. And again, over here on the side is the Get Docker button. This will start our Docker download. All right, the Docker download is finished. We'll go ahead and install this like we would most any other Mac OS application.
We start by opening and mounting the disk image file that we just downloaded. And then simply dragging Docker for Mac to the application shortcut. First time it runs, it does need to verify that everything is in good shape, and you need to confirm that you do indeed want to open it. Once Docker for Mac is started, you can find the icon for it in the title bar and see that it is indeed running. We can verify that it's running as expected by issuing a docker run busybox command to download and start a busybox image and container. It will start, run, and then stop. We can verify that it ran by typing docker ps-a, this will list out all of the Docker containers that have run and stopped on our system. In this case, I'm going to grep or search just for containers containing the word busybox to see that I do indeed have a busybox container that started and exited less than a second ago. This shows that Docker is working as expected. Our final step in this learning lab is the summary step that indicates that we have successfully completed and encourages us to go check out another DevNet learning lab to put our development environment to the test.